Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. It is straight up 2 o'clock. I am very excited to be here on another beautiful day in San Diego. And uh, we are going to, I think we're going to have a good time today. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and uh, I'm excited to get started on it. So uh, we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors, and my name is Kevin Burke, and there is my telephone number, and there is my email address. And so again, as I always say, I'd rather speak with you in person, but if that's not possible, you can always send me an email, and I'm more than happy to, to uh, help you uh, in any way that I can. And I frequently respond to people at one and two in the morning, and yes, I'm up at that time, <laughs> so I enjoy what I do. I really like my business. So uh that being said, let's go ahead and get going. Um, I have uh, some credentials that make me qualified, I guess, to speak about the subject matter. I've been in uh, real estate for well over 40 years, uh, and I have uh, I'm a bro I have a broker's license in several states, um, and I'm a certified instructor uh, in uh, several states. So anyway, that being said, um, I also do teach continuing education for attorneys uh, at uh, UCSD. Um, spoke, uh, taught legal aspects of real estate for many years at various colleges uh, in San Diego County. And uh, I forgot to change my, uh, so at NAR last year, I was the chair of the risk management issues committee for um, the West group. And then last year, I was also the chair of CAR's realtor risk management and consumer protection forum. And then this year, which I forgot to put in there, but this year, uh, coming up in 2024, I am chair of the Legal Affairs uh, Forum. So uh, all the lawyers get to come to me, and and uh, as they do almost on a daily basis anyway. So it's a it's a, quite a happy group. Uh, you know, I, I I talk to lawyers all the time. So uh, anyway, that being said, those are that's what I got going on. We're going to be talking about stuff today that's going to appear to be legal. I am not a practicing attorney. I, I actually enjoy starting all my webinars with that, and and just to tell everybody, I'm having way more fun than I think they are. Um, and I have uh, much less uh, work to do, and, and I think I make a lot more money than they do. So uh, hopefully that applies to you as well. It's a it's a tough uh, it's a tough job. I knew my last uh, semester in law school that I was just not going to practice. I, I just uh, I like what I do uh, too much. Law degree was in 1996. The uh, got in real estate in '79. So at this point in time, I, I got my law degree about halfway through my career. Uh, and uh, I'm glad I made the decision not to go uh, uh, back. In fact, uh, way more than half the way through my career here. So uh, that being said, uh, my trial work is limited to testifying as an expert witness um, on uh, standard of care is my specialty. Did the agent do what they were supposed to do um, given the circumstances of the situation, uh, agent's duties of inspection and disclosure, and finally market conditions in San Diego County. So, um, our conversation today, not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney, please consult with them as appropriate. So if your broker tells you to do something, you need to follow your broker's instruction, because remember, again, your broker is responsible for you. Okay. Uh, that being said, uh, let's uh, jump forward. Our webinars are intended to be interactive. Please utilize the Q&A button to ask questions offer input. I do look forward to hearing from you. It really helps me because as you ask questions, it kind of helps me set the direction uh, and the tone of where we're going to go today. So uh, that being said, uh, let me check the volume here. I think we're good. All right. That looks good. Uh, 86, uh, a little bit less. There you go. All right. So if you can't hear me, please let me know, right? That kind of thing. If you Obviously, if you, if you can hear me, then you, you, you not can't hear me. So anyway, um, so today, uh, this morning, we started off with top 10 risk avoidance techniques. And that was a good example of, of a webinar that, uh, you know, I did this webinar a week ago, um, and it took a completely different direction uh, this morning. So um, I will load this one up as well. Um, the webinars at this point are free, they, they'll continue to be free. Um, I'm doing these for SDAR, depending on uh, how things go. I may be uh, creating my own podcast here coming up. Um, I already did a podcast for the Department of Real Estate. Uh, they asked me to do a podcast on legal documentation uh, necessary in a real estate transaction. And uh, uh, it was a very, uh, I really had a good time. I have to tell you, I had an hour and a half uh, with one of the assistant commissioners uh, in charge of marketing, Rick, Rick Lopes, uh, Superman. Uh, and uh, he asked a lot of really good questions and we had an hour and a half together. So he's going to have to trim that down to five minutes and, 
or something like that. So on November the 29th, they, they will publish that. So you'll have access to it. I'm, I'm sure I'll be having it up on all my screens and everything, but uh, I really had a good time with that. He asked a lot of really good questions and, uh, and uh, I think we got a lot of headway on that. And there are a lot of things that, that, uh, you know, the, the department of real estate reaches out to me because, you know, I'm a practitioner like you and, and they can't necessarily see everything that, that we see. So uh um, today, this afternoon now, we're going to talk about the 2023 changes to the RPA, um, but I'm also going to give you some other stuff. I'm going to show you some things that, uh, that uh, other uh, forms changes that we made as well and some things that are referenced in the contract that'll be, that'll be helpful, but we're definitely going to start off with changes to the RPA. So um, Tuesday, so we're going to take next week off. Next week is uh, Thanksgiving week. So we're going to take next week off, and uh, uh, that means uh, you get you get a break. Uh, and then uh, I come back on – hi, Ron. Welcome back. Uh, and then I come back on Tuesday, the 28th, uh, doing one of my favorite subjects, which is the new BRBC. And so um, – and, and again, that form has changed uh, again – uh, fairly recently, and I can tell you that uh, the changes are good changes. So, um, um, the uh, and and for those of you, I get a lot of phone calls about the uh, Burnett decision, uh, federal court. I had an attorney call me this morning for my opinion on it, uh, and so you know I, I can't give you legal advice, but I would tell you folks, business as usual. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep getting those buyer representation agreements signed. Those are going to be really important for you um, because part of the of the case had to do with. Uh, transparency of our commissions and how much money, you know, we're as the seller's agent, how much we're paying the buyer's agent. And, and it was the sellers that brought, brought the lawsuit. Hypothetically, they represented the class. Um, but we are years away from the appeal being heard. Uh, and uh, but the process has already begun. The uh, appeals have already been filed. The copycat lawsuits have already started coming our way. You know, we just know these are just normal things that we have to deal with in our uh, our legal system at this point, our, our judicial system. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, I'm going to tell you again, business as usual. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep using that buyer representation agreement. OK. All right. And then in the afternoon on the on Tuesday, we will talk about uh, open house success again. Again, how do you make money in this business one of the easiest things you can ever do is do an open house but uh, i'm going to teach you how to be uh, aggressive hi Yaquan. how are you um how to be aggressive about uh, uh doing business and making a lot of money open houses are fun so uh that being said uh, member benefits today thank you for joining us for our conversation our discussion of changes to the rpa in 2023 so um, the the um, the California Association of Realtors took all the forms uh, that are coming out, and let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up our um, uh, where is it here? Let me close that one and uh, go to this one. I'm gonna go to the home page. Um, if I go here to Transaction Center and I click on that, and I go over here to Standard Forms, I click on Standard Forms. Down here, Forms, Revisions, and New Form Releases. You can see that they pulled the December form releases um, off the website. And part of the reason behind that is because of the Burnett decision, they want to go through all their forms. They don't want to leave some up, take some down, and then piecemeal it back and forth. They just took the whole thing down. Um, and so uh, I'm going to show you that I actually have the versions, the red line versions before they took them down. And so, again, not to be used prior to distribution when they will come out at the end of uh, December uh, in anticipation of the new laws uh, beginning on January the 1st. So, again, like with everything else that I do, if you want copies of all of this, please send me an email. I am happy to send it to you. If you are getting my newsletter, then it is uh, uh, underneath the classes that I'm teaching. The, the very first thing you see on the right hand side is a link to the December forms as they existed, the, the December forms coming out now in 2023, uh, as they existed just prior to them taking them down off of the website. So, okay, so that being said, uh, where did I go here? Am I uh, logged in? I gotta make sure I get logged in on that one. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of this stuff I'm gonna show you live. So, uh, whoops, where'd I go? Okay, so we're gonna go back here. So we are at uh, changes to the RPA. Um, I have always said, if you know the RPA, if you know the residential purchase agreement, you know real estate. And so I make that's kind of a bold statement because if you think about it, you know, there's 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 people out there that will teach you that you have to list or perish. You know, you've got to get take a lot of listings and things like that. You won't make any money unless you have listings. I kind of think 
I'm a little counterintuitive on that. I think that that uh, that's a great way to take uh, to to get an employment agreement going with a client. But at the same time, there's no money in it unless somebody brings you an offer. And so, you know, we have listings out there that are not selling. We have listings out there that are going five and six offers. But I always figure if I've got a buyer, then I've got a paycheck. Joe Jelly used to say, if you represent a seller, you may never get paid. If you represent a buyer, you're, you're 30 days away from a paycheck. And I thought that was really good advice. So I'm just really big on, on knowing how my purchase agreement works. And so um, on that note, I should tell you that, um, the, that my... Uh, RPA class has been approved for DRE credit for five hours of DRE credit. Um, they, uh, it was interesting because, you know, for every hour of, and, and that's not this class, by the way. Um, so for every hour of instruction, they require three hours of printed material. So let me see, let me see if I got that right. Five hours times three pages per hour is 15 pages. So I think I sent them 36 pages. So, uh, let me see here if I can find it without too much uh, fanfare, as we say. And so I have a whole little section of all the classes that have been that uh, the DRE is doing with me. So uh, here's uh, let me see. Here's DRE. Here's the uh, uh, RPA for continuing ed. And let's see. What did I do here? Um, uh, do, 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 do. There's my cover letter. There's my narrative outline. Let me see. Is this the long one? I think this is this is the long one. And so this is the one I wrote for the Department of Real Estate. And uh, as soon as the the fanfare is over with 34 pages, uh, all about the uh, the residential purchase agreement. I'm very proud. Um, they called me on the phone and they said, we're very excited to get to read your your paper on uh, the residential purchase agreement. So uh, just kind of one of those high points in my career. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Whoops, you can't see it because I forgot to share the page. Here you go. So uh, this is the uh, actual uh, uh, documentation that I did. Uh, and uh, again, this is what they called me about. And they said, wow, we're so excited. We can't wait to read that. So so anyway, just so you're aware, that's that's out there. I did the presentation uh, for NAREB, CARREB uh, in Oakland uh, two weeks ago um, uh, for their group. And uh, it was interesting. The first, it was in two parts. First half of the class, um, you know, it, it was probably 10, 12 people. Second uh, half of the class, there's like 30 people. <laughs> it's just like everybody's telling everybody else how much fun it was so hopefully you feel the same way but uh, anyway that's the point behind all that i wanted to show you that and, and uh, we'll go ahead and go back to back to reality so uh that good uh car changes its forms um approximately twice a year so uh it, it is twice a year it's just approximately means we don't know when but but um they change them in response to legislation and litigation. And so we we change our forms the end of December. So it'll be roughly the 23rd of December. We'll come out with a new forms. Um, that is in anticipation of the laws that are going to take effect on the 1st of January. Then we change them again in June, June 26th, June 27th. Uh, and that is in anticipation of the, of the new laws that will take effect on July the 1st. So that's the whole point behind why we do that. We change our forms. We know what's coming. Uh, we've rarely been uh, we, we we got blindsided uh, with uh, 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 Newsom's um, uh, statewide rent control. We literally had a month to come out with those forms um, uh, because it wasn't on the books, so to speak, at that time. Um, I've also got the, uh, a, a printout of the new laws. If you're interested in that, send me an email uh, and be specific about what you want or I'm not going to know. Um, but uh, I've got uh, already the breakdown of the new laws that are coming out on the 1st of January. So, so be aware of legislation, litigation. Um, and uh, again, that's why uh, we pulled the forms off the website is because we wanted to respond to the to the uh, outcome of the Burnett case, uh, just uh, in anticipation of other things happening. So 19 changes were recently made to the purchase agreements. And most all of those changes occurred in December of last year. There, there was some minor change that I'll show you that occurred in uh, just recently. Uh, and uh, you'll get a kick out of it when I show you. But uh, the same changes um, uh, were made to all of the purchase agreements. So um, the residential purchase agreement, the residential income purchase agreement, the commercial purchase agreement. So all of the purchase agreements had roughly the same changes made to them. And so um, at some point, I don't know if uh, SDR is going to hire me to come back, but but uh, I do the new forms uh, every year. 
year. Uh, and if, uh, um, if they, they have me come back and talk about it, I'll talk about the new forms uh, and all the updates and things that they're going to be doing. I'll talk about the new laws. I do this every, I've done this every year for roughly 15 years for the San Diego Association. Um, if that doesn't happen, then uh, uh, stay tuned to my podcast because I'll be, I'll be breaking down the forms. Some of you will remember I used to do um, you know, an, an hour long presentation rather than a two hour long presentation where we addressed only the the the, uh, the one document and only uh, by paragraph. So paragraph one, paragraph two. And then, and then again, when we get to liquidated damages, we'd spend a whole hour just on that paragraph, you know, things like an arbitration, you know, likewise, same kind of thing. So, so be prepared for that. It's a possibility. And, and I will be uh, still doing a podcast. It just may be, um, uh, you'll have to get there through uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, um, uh, my link from my newsletter, my newsletter will always have current and up-to-date uh, items in there. Okay. So, um, let's see. So, okay, well, here we go. Our IPA, the uh, CPA, the, the uh, VLPA, the Vacant Land Purchase Agreement, the NODPA, which uh, I didn't pull up this time. And I'm going to tell you something, the NODPA. So the NODPA is the Notice of Default Purchase Agreement. So it's just like the purchase agreement, but they've added some language in there that is required by statute. And so it changed again recently. Um, and, and as you know, if you've heard any of my talks, I talk about that because the uh, Notice of Default Purchase Purchase agreement is the uh, a document that uh, was created. Hi, Linda. Um, was the document that was created uh, um, to uh, provide the notice to the seller of their statutory right to rescind the contract within five days of accepting it. Uh, and so I've got four scenarios. I've got, um, it's a it's a residential one to four, which means a, a single family home, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex. The seller is living in the home or one of the homes. The buyer is not intending to live in one or more of the homes. And there's a notice of default filed against the property. And if all four of those things are present, then uh, then it is uh, you must use the NODPA to notify the seller of their statutory right to rescind. And again, rescind is a very powerful word of law. It says make the put the parties back in the position that they were in prior to contract. So it's very, very important. OK, and and, and the pen, <laughs> excuse me. The penalty, I get a little excited. The penalty for not doing that is a year in jail, $25,000 worth of, of uh, criminal penalties. So there's no E&O coverage for conviction of crime uh, and unspecified civil damages. So, so my advice is, again, if you, if you, if you don't know what, what that all is all about, let me just pull it up here really fast because, uh, you know, uh, CAR, we do such a great, uh, they do such a great job there. But um, again, we, we create really good stuff. Let's do uh, NODPA. Um, but then we create it and then we set it loose and we and we don't do anything else with it. And so it's like, you know, people uh, don't know what it is that uh, we did because we don't tell them about it. So uh, here we go. So this is the article. I've been given credit for writing this article. I did not write this article. Um, this is the NOD and Investor Transactions uh, Home Equity Sales Contracts. And again, you saw I typed in NODPA. Um, and this is a very good breakdown of what I just told you a minute ago. And here it is. Here are the four things. Okay. And so, uh, you know, the key, the key ingredient to remember in your head, if you're doing residential one to four, which I think you are, um, you know, if you're, if you're representing an investor, you need to keep your ears open and your eyes open. Um, you're representing an investor. Somebody's not going to live in the property. And by the way, they may not think they're an investor, but if they're not, I had a case uh, up in San Clemente where the uh, newlywed couple was buying a house. Um, the uh, seller was living in the house. It was a residential one to four. Um, and there was an NOD filed against the property a notice of default filed against the property and the um and so everybody's fine right because the buyer's living it going to live in the house well then they had to add dad to the loan um in order to get the loan on the property it turns out that they needed him to guarantee the loan he was on he was uh going on title seller sued because the buyer became what's referred to as an equity purchaser because they weren't going to live in the home and so you know be aware there's some really tricky parts about all this so i would grab 
have this article. I would read this article. It, it's Civil Code 1695. Um, I had a, a lot of call for many years traveling around telling people about it, but people have kind of thought that, wow, you know, the foreclosure market, you know, the the um, uh, seller being in default, there aren't that many of them. That's not true. We have a bankruptcy attorney who works in our office as a broker, uh, and he says he's seeing more uh, defaults now than he has in a very long time. So, folks, be prepared. Market's changing. Um, uh, even though you may not think that when you're writing your offer, um, but but that's the bottom line is make sure you're aware of that NODPA, okay? Very, very important point. So I uh, wanted to make sure I brought that to your attention. Um, and so let's go ahead back here. Um, subdivision property, so my NCPA, my, that's my new construction purchase agreement, and then the ABSPA and the CCSPA, and so things like that. Okay, so so let's take a look. Uh, I want to take a look at a couple of things, and so um, uh, this is from the purchase agreement uh, as it existed prior to December of 22. So this is what the language looked like, and then what did we do? Well, we changed the language. So up at the top is the language as it appeared, and then down at the bottom is what we changed it to. So you can see we made a couple of adjustments. Um, we uh, uh, prior to this we had uh, um, we had the, the uh, we made bullet points. We had the uh, rate not to exceed a certain figure. Look at that, I've got five percent in there. Wouldn't we like to get five percent money again now? Uh, and so they make decisions, you know, obviously without uh, consulting with me. Um, but um, and then uh, and then uh, zero points uh, or up to one percent loan amount, which is now buyer. We, we've taken that zero out. We just said buyer to pay up to a certain amount of points to obtain the rate above. Folks, you want to be sure when you do when you fill out your purchase agreement that you complete this part of the agreement. And the reason is that if you don't, then the buyer may not have a loan contingency. And remember, your job as the buyer agent is to protect the buyer. You're not writing the offer for the seller. You're writing the offer for the buyer. Um, so you, you definitely need to fill this out. Now, sometimes I see counter offers that say, you know, buyer to accept loan at best prevailing rate and terms. That's essentially taking away the buyer's loan contingency. And so you want to be careful. Check with your broker about that. I would advise against having the buyer accept that kind of language. Um, sometimes it's just a knee-jerk reaction. You know, uh, agents will, will write stuff that they heard in the past that was so cool. They just, you know, somebody did it to them. So now they're going to do it. Uh, and I just think I need to caution everybody that's probably not a good idea to remove the buyer's loan contingency at the time of the offer. And if you do do that, then you need to make sure you use the CR, CR form. Uh, it's now the CRB form, the contingency removal for the buyer form. Um, and then there's uh, also the um, uh, CAR has a really good Q&A that we make the buyers sign if they're going to remove a contingency at the time of the offer. So um, we just don't feel it's worth doing a transaction where uh, can't remember, it's only good that the, the buyer's ability to exit the transaction based on the loan contingency is only good during the period of the loan. So, you know, in most cases today, most of our buyers are pre-approved for a loan. I mean, I, we just represented a buyer who was fully uh, underwritten pre-approved for a loan. So um, you may feel more confident about changing the time period, but I wouldn't change the loan period and don't change the time period unless you've consulted with the lender about the realities of whether or not they'll be able to get that done in time. OK, so that's kind of important. You'll see on the right hand side over here, you've got your uh, conventional if checked. Uh, we've got um, the FHA. We've separated them out now up at the top. We had FHA VA. Now we have FHA and that's the FVA CHID bundle it's called is attached. I like the bundle. Um, and if it's a VA transaction, it doesn't include the HID. The HID is the notice to the FHA buyer that uh, that they should get a home inspection done. Does that make sense to everybody? The um, FVAC is my um, FHA VA a mandatory clause. And, and, the, and, and I love the form. Uh, let's let's take a look at it for a second. You want to make sure that it is, it is completed properly. And uh, here I am. Let's go to uh, forms. Uh, and I'm going to uh, see if I can do this without hurting myself, add a form. Uh, and we're going to go all libraries and we're going to call it the FVAC. This is the new uh, program that's out there. So uh, we'll do add 
uh, and then uh, close that. And so this is my FVAC form. Um, and this form essentially, and, and, and by the way, in, in these types of loans, the, the FHA and the VA, the lender's going to require everybody to sign their version of it if you don't provide it. Um, so here it is, paragraph number one, that uh, essentially you put it, you got to make sure you put in the, the uh, purchase price of the property, uh, has to appraise for the value that they're agreeing to pay for it. Uh, and uh, all it really says is that the buyer may not be compelled to purchase the home if it doesn't appraise. They can still do it, um, but the... Um, um, uh, you know, again, again, you know, that's up to them. I, I had a buyer who, who uh, was a, a retired SEAL who decided he was going to buy a house. And I said, well, they're, they're asking you to remove your appraisal contingency. And he said, fine, not a problem. I said, well, if it doesn't appraise, it could cost you 500 grand. He says, don't worry about it. I've got it. So I never asked him the question about where'd you get $500,000. Um, but, you know, uh, thank you for your service. That's all I can say. So uh, anyway, that's my FVAC form. All right. Everybody good with that? Uh, okay. So, uh, um, and that's the reference right over over here. Um, then we have seller financing and then we have other and most of the rest of this is uh, still pretty much the same. It was just the addition of the of the bullet points. So um, let me see here. Uh, yep. Um, and then uh, additional finance amount. Uh, so a couple little changes on this, not a whole bunch, but uh, obviously um, uh, conventional or seller financing because FHA and VA don't uh, don't do uh, secondary financing. All right, everybody good. The language in here stayed the same for the additional financing. Uh, we added in the new contract, we added again, not to exceed a percent buyer to pay up to a certain amount of points. And this again was to be consistent with the uh, paragraph uh, uh, for the uh, previous paragraph number 3D. Okay. All right. That being said, no default for the number of points. It was zero, right? Up here, zero points if you didn't fill in the blank. Again, I, I, I encourage you to fill in the blank, um, but uh, there was uh, no default um, uh, for the number of points that used to be zero. Now you got to put in a number. Points are now tailored to the specific interest rate, which I kind of think they should be. Uh, and then finally, uh, the grid was reorganized so that the bullet points will apply to either a fixed or an adjustable rate loan. <clears throat> Let me go back to that so you can see it really quick. Here's my fixed or adjustable, uh, depending on you know which box that you checked. Okay, everybody good? Anybody have any questions so far on that? I'm going to use that as an excuse to get some water. I am hoping, I'm pretty sure we're going to get done on time. Um, actually a little bit early. Um, I always say that and then I don't know what happens, but <laughs> y'all ask really good questions. So, um, paragraph number three, G3. So I like paragraph number three, G3. Let's take a look at that. Um, so here's, here is the way it did appear in the purchase agreement before December of 22. Seller agrees to pay the obligation of the buyer to compensate the buyer's broker under a separate agreement. So, so here's how this works. So we have a form called the SPBB form. All right. In fact, you know what? Probably just as easy to show it to you. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Transactions. We're going to go back. We're going to say save. No, uh, we're going to click on SPBB. Uh, nope. Doesn't want me to do that. It wants to make things difficult. So let's go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll be good with difficult. Uh, we're going to add, and again, we're going to type in here my SPBB, and there it is, seller's payment to buyer's broker. So, so now we've already talked about the buyer um, representation agreement is, is the way you're going to just have to figure it out. You're going to have to do business with it uh, moving forward if you haven't been already. Okay. And so uh, I do many talks for uh, brokerage firms. Um, and I can tell you that, uh, in fact, I did a talk recently with a brokerage firm and I was talking about the buyer representation agreement. The broker asked me to come in and talk about it. And uh, um, so I did, I got, I got in there. I was talking about it. One of the agents came, you know, piped up. Up in the, it was a Zoom call, uh, piped up and said, you know, um, I'm not going to use it. And the broker got in on the conversation and said, as a matter of fact, it is our company policy. You are going to use it. Um, and so um, I, I don't understand the resistance other than 99% of the time, I'll ask the question, have you ever read it? Um, and I'll usually get an answer that says no, uh, or I skimmed through it or something like that. So let's take a look at it just really quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, but uh, only only use the form if you already have a buyer representation agreement um, and 
uh, and these three conditions are present. Okay, so uh, down and and again, they we let the seller know they can accept it, reject it, or counter it as as with any other term in the buyer's offer. So again, here's my statutory or I'm sorry, regulatory language. The commissioner's office wants this language that says that all commissions are negotiable at law. So um, so in this case, between the seller and the broker, um, the amount would be a dollar. The rate would be a percentage. Um, and they may be negotiable between the seller and the broker, in this case, uh, the buyer's broker. Um, and that includes any and all fees that the that the uh, uh, seller is asked to pay. So three paragraphs. Paragraph number one, how much is your buyer representation agreement for? So in our case, we we have a fixed amount. We put it in there and we put that dollar amount or that percentage in there. Um, how much is the compensation in the MLS that's coming to us? We put that figure in here. And then finally, the third thing is this is how much we're asking the seller to pay. So let's just for laughs and giggles, our, our buyer representation agreement says 10 percent. Um, the seller's paying us 5%. Um, in number three, we can put in either seven or eight or, or whatever. Um, the seller doesn't have to agree to it. The seller can come back with a different figure. Uh, in all of the time that this form has been out, I've been refused twice. Um, and both of those uh, other things happen in the transaction that are going to get the DRE involved in them. So, you know, it's just kind of set the stage for, you know, these things that weren't going to go well. So anyway, just so just so you're aware. Um, uh, and then uh, down here, we, we talk about um, um, lots of other stuff. Anyway, that's the SPBB form. I wanted you to see that. That's my uh, seller's purchase of a uh, seller's payment of of buyer's broker under that separate agreement. So again, it assumes that I have a buyer representation agreement. So when I'm looking at this here, this says I got to attach it. Seller's broker. This is the old one. Seller's broker's offer, if any, to compensate the buyer broker is unaffected unless otherwise agreed. In other words, unless the seller agrees, nothing changes. Okay. All right. Uh, that being said, let's take a look at the new version of it. And the new version of it says, uh, hi, Ron. Uh, the new version of it says, seller agrees to pay the obligation of the bro of the buyer to compensate the buyer's broker on a separate agreement. Uh, but, 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 but that looks like the same thing, doesn't it? I'm looking at it. Seller's broker, if any, to compensate buyer's broker is unaffected, unless otherwise agreed. That looks like the same thing to me. I don't know what the <laughs> Why did they tell me it changed? It did not. I don't think it changed. Does anybody see the change in there? I don't see a change in there. That's funny. Okay. Anyway, that's 3G3. Um, and, and I like 3G3. It's in the same place. It references paragraph number 18. Um, again, we, uh, all of our agents do it. Uh, they, everybody uh, is doing, and you're going to see a lot of people, there's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork now as a result of the Burnett decision, you know, uh, offering to teach by a representation agreement. Remember, my class is approved by the Department of Real Estate, um, but it has to be a live in person in front of you class. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, and here's paragraph 18, uh, G3 or 18, uh, uh, that references the compensation. I just pulled that part up. And in parentheses on the right-hand side, if the seller agrees to pay the buyer's broker, seller shall be entitled to a copy of the written portion of the compensation agreement. So in other words, page one, right? Because page I just showed you, um, well, I just showed you the, well, page one, let's just take my word for it. Page one of the purchase agreement has compensation in it. It's actually paragraph number four. Um, and so uh, they're entitled to see it because, you know, obviously you got to prove up the fact that, that you do in fact have a buyer representation agreement and that is in fact for 10 percent or for whatever okay all right uh good that being said uh in summary um optional right for the buyer to ask the seller to pay compensation due to the buyer's broker directly so again remember that um that uh it's a checkbox you see right here it's a checkbox so um so the, the you don't you don't have to check the box uh, you have to have the instruction from the buyer uh, to uh, provide that to the seller. Uh, and that instruction comes from the actual, hey, John, uh, that, that instruction comes from the actual uh, uh, offer by the buyer. So the buyer representation agreement, you check the box that says the, the buyer authorizes you to ask the seller for more money, or, or I can't imagine less, but more money. Um, and then in the purchase agreement, which is what this is, now we check the box that says we're following through on our buyer's instruction to ask the seller to pay for that uh, that uh, compensation as as we are committed to pay for it in the buyer in the uh, buyer representation agreement. Okay, and again, obviously you've got to prove that you actually.
actually have an agreement and that's what the contract says it says we have an agreement currently uh and uh um and so you, know, you should have one right i mean um i, I wouldn't be asking for it. you're going to be you're going to be required to provide it anyway okay all right so that being said uh we talk, uh, and then I showed you this part already. So we're through that. And then there's my summary. Um, and then that is, so the buyer has a commitment to pay. And in my scenario, 10%, um, the buyer has a commitment to pay the 10%. They merely ask the seller to pay all or part of that 10%, not more than that uh, 10% to pay the, the buyer's agent directly. Now, remember that in most cases, uh, and I say most, because I need to clarify this, but but in most cases, the uh, the uh, buyer's agent is already being compensated by virtue of what the seller's agent's listing looks like with the seller. So in paragraph number three A of the listing agreement, the uh, the uh, uh, seller agrees to pay the the seller's agent X whatever that figure is, and then in paragraph three D, the seller uh, the seller is notified by the seller's agent, how much out of 3A they're going to compensate the cooperating broker in the transaction. And that's what 3D does. Okay. So um, again, the scenario that, I, and it was interesting because uh, uh, CAR, the staff attorney said, you know, it won't be necessary in many cases because you're already being compensated. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of, uh, of uh, commissions in the MLS that are, and again, we're not going to we're not going to get into what they should be or anything like that because that'd be an antitrust violation, uh, specifically a Sherman antitrust violation for those of you uh, keeping score. Um, but let's just say that there are uh, commissions that are being offered to us are less than what we're used to working for, um, and so we want to make sure we lock that up with the buyer. The buyer agrees, and we've had a very good conversation. You sit down with the buyer, folks. You don't send it to them and say, here, if you have any questions, let me know. I've had some really bad lawsuits on that where the agent, you know, said, oh yeah, I gave it to the TC, the TC sent it over. I sent the buyer an email that said, let me know if you have any questions. And, and that is a very poor defense. Okay. All right. So, so in, in our scenario, I believe you should sit down with the buyer and have a consultation with them. Uh, I can tell you the department of real estate agrees with me. Uh, when I did the RPA, uh, the four hour RPA for the department of real estate, um, they asked and they said, well, how do you go over this with the buyer if they're not in the area? And I said, we have all of the, and we have Google Meet, we have Microsoft Teams, we have all those things. Um, and even some of our software will actually do it for us where we are on and, and eye to eye with the buyer of the property going through each paragraph and, and making sure that we have, a, we have a, a chance to advise and counsel. That is our job. So, so uh, that being said, um, that's what this is all about. Um, but one other part of it that I haven't talked about yet and that is you know, the commissions that we're seeing. Um, remember that across the country now, they, they, there, there used to be this trend to have a 1% or, or I'm sorry, a one, uh, $1 lower limit. But the law says that there, there is no minimum, there is no maximum. It is negotiable. So uh, MLS is across the country, including bright MLS in, uh, on the East Coast, um, are, have now allowed a zero for the commissions. And I'm seeing zero. Um, so if, if you're not seeing zero, God love you, you're, you're doing good. But I am seeing uh, listings uh, where the compensation to the cooperating broker is, is not what we're used to getting paid. So as a result, our, I want to say we're used to, I'm, I'm referring to our brokerage uh, is not, not used to getting paid. You get paid whatever you want to get paid, but I'm not going to rely on the seller's agent paying uh, my fee. I'm going to have the buyer do that. And then I'm going to notify the buyer before I show them the property, you know, what the commission is being offered by the seller, uh, seller's agent, and they can make a decision if they want to move forward or not, knowing that if they do decide to move forward, they have to make up the difference. Is everybody good with that? I just want to make sure we're really clear about that. Okay. Again, you, your broker has an obligation at law to establish a minimum commission for your office. Um, and that is not something that I need to share with you, not something you need to share with me. I don't want to know how what your minimums are. Um, I can only tell you that the law requires that the broker establish a minimum commission. That would be your Exhibit A um, referenced in your independent contract, your agreement, your ICA. Okay, seeing no questions. God, I'm glad you're all here. I really am. Thank you for being here today.
Um, okay, so it's uh, according to CAR staff attorneys, it's not necessary in most of our transactions because we are being compensated. Um, I disagree because uh, um, we're not always being compensated. Plus, we're not always being compensated the amount that we that we would personally work for, and and you decide what that bar looks like on your side. Okay, all right. Assuming that there is a buyer representation and broker compensation agreement in place. Okay, all right. Buyer's agent is willing to accept the offer of compensation in indicated in the MLS, and that happens a lot of times. Um, we're, we're seeing more and more uh, where we're writing offers on properties that uh, are not. And, and so we always ask for, we always have a buyer representation agreement. And then the key principle behind that is that the buyer uh, representation agreement makes the buyer our client, not just our customer. Um, and so um, as a client, we represent them. We tell them everything, be very thorough, be very transparent about uh, your uh, commissions and how much you're being paid. Um, so you need to attach the SP, uh, CR form SPBB, which I already showed you, only applies if there is actually a written buyer representation broker compensation agreement. By the way, I really like the new form. Um, again, it was uh, the, previously there were three forms that essentially it's a listing agreement, right? It's an employment agreement, um, but it mirrored the three listing agreements that we had with sellers. Uh, um, and we needed to, to kind of untangle it and make it uh, a little more understandable. And so uh, uh, I'm not sure if we accomplished that objective. When I do the class on the 28th on the BRBC, I'll show you that, that you know, depending on what boxes you check, it's going to change the matrix of the situation completely. OK. All right. Um, sellers now entitled to a copy of the CAR form BRBC. So uh, and again, as we read a second ago, a copy of the commission page. So page one, they don't have to see the rest of it necessarily. Um, but but I would I would you know, if, if you've got something else in there that that creates a different scenario that alters uh, what the buyer owes you if the seller doesn't pay you, then I would I would fess up. And show the whole thing. I wouldn't just, you know, don't don't try to hide stuff like that. It's not not uh, it's not going to look good in trial. Let's say that it'll never get to trial. It'll go to deposition. It'll be over. Um, so uh, what other change? So we also saw a change to 3M3, which is the uh, tenant occupied units. And, and this was actually pretty thoughtful the way they figured this out. So the TOPA, and I really like the TOPA form. Um, so under the old rule, um, if tenant occupied the TA or other attached. Okay. So under the new contract, um, still M3, but now it's, uh, uh, we're going to reference paragraph 4A and 7A occupied units. Okay. So remember up, up top, it said the old way it said tenant occupied. Now we're going to say occupied units by tenant or anyone other than the seller. Um, I'm sure you've had situations where you've written an offer on the property where the seller's not in it and there's not a tenant in it. It's a family member or a, a squatter or something like that that's in the property. And so how do you address that? You've already defined it as either as being a tenant. Well, it's, but what if it's not a tenant? Okay. And so, you know, we want to get, we won't get into tenants at will versus tenants at sufferance and things like that, but, but just be, be aware that it can be occupied by the tenant, which was the previous version or anyone other than the seller. So, you know, so, so in other words, we already know that if it's a tenant, it's probably not the seller unless the seller is occupying part of the property, which is which is possible. Um, but this just covers that. This just closes that loop and says anybody other than the seller. OK, and so now in the middle, we've got a checkbox, the checkbox now in the middle. Right. So it moved over from the right hand side uh, and uh, or I should do that this way. Right. Because you're. Uh, yeah, I keep forgetting when I'm teaching, I'm supposed to do everything backwards. So anyway, now I check the box when I'm writing the offer. Um, that the TOPA is, is included. I don't need uh, other, other reference, other things like the tenant estoppel certificate and things like that. So now the explanation occurs over here on the left side, seller shall disclose to buyer if occupied by tenants or persons other than the seller and attach TOPA and a counter offer if not part of the buyer's offer. So as long as the buyer brings forward the TOPA form, and we have this happen a lot where the buyer doesn't do that, they forget to do that. Now, technically speaking, when you click this box, it loads the TOPA form into your transaction. So it should be there, all right? So, but let's take a look. I wanna show the TOPA form, uh, let's see if I even have it up here. I think I do. Um, let's see here, uh, how do I do this? Uh, forms. Uh, God, I hate this. All right, so let's let's add another form. So we're going to kill that one, and then uh, we're going to add another form. Look at that. See, twelve years of college. 
down the tube. So let's go ahead. I'm going to pull up my TOPA, and that's my uh, tenant occupied property addendum. I I really like this form. I think it's a way cool form. Uh, and this is what it's going to look like. Okay, so it's gonna it's going to say the tenant is going to remain in possession. Default language: the tenant stays in possession, or or statement right here, or property to be delivered vacant. OK, and so so we have a number of scenarios. And again, if the tenant is in it now and the tenant says, I'm out of there by Friday, don't believe it. You, you have to use this form anyway, just in the eventuality that the tenant is not out by Friday. You know, a lot of times we have the tenant trying to go to another property, you know, and and uh, and that was not available yet. And they get delayed and you get delayed and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have to make a decision here. Um, but it says here, tenant is going to mean anyone other than. Uh, I mean, any adult person, anyone over the age of consent, age of 18, other than the sellers occupying the property, whether or not paying rent, we don't care if they're paying rent or not. And so in B, it says which units are going to be delivered vacant. So the property or unit numbers will be delivered without the existing tenant. That's number one. Um, if the seller, after exercise of good faith, the tenants and subject applicable law is unable to remove the existing tenant uh, by closing or five days before, if you check the box, the buyer may cancel the agreement and buyer's sole remedy shall be return of the deposit and their reasonable out-of-pocket expenses for reports and appraisals under the agreement. They may elect to proceed with the transaction with the tenant in possession, but then they waive any claims for damages or compensation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so, um, so that kind of closes that loop. So if this, if the buyer, the buyer has the ability to accept the property with the tenant in it, and that's why this form is so important. That that is why we made such a big deal out of it. Now, my advice to you: you are the seller's agent, uh, and you take a listing on a property that has a tenant in it. I would get that TEC form uh, signed right away. In fact, uh, uh, I actually have that. Um, form uh i've got here uh here's the here are the changes coming on the on the uh tenant occupied property addendum um and uh let me see here uh these are change these are after it changed i think yeah there we go security deposits uh, itemization of all lawful deductions etc cetera, etc cetera. this is on the topa i wanted to show you the tos tec so here's what's happening uh notice here 12 of 23 this is what the uh, tenant is solving. and john i know you joined a little bit late but uh i have all of the uh forms that are um that are uh, that CAR pulled off of their website um, when the Burnett decision came down. So if you want the red line versions, I, I had downloaded all the minute I saw them, I downloaded them right away, right? Because I never know how long they're going to be there. Um, but they'll they'll put them back up after they're finished their edits, and they're going to edit a lot of stuff based on the Burnett decision. So this is just you know uh, what what we had before they did that. So uh, so here are the rental agreements. This is the TEC, a whole different form than it was before. I'm kind of wishing that I. Had and they made a grid out of it, which, by the way, they're also looking at doing the same thing with the buyer material issue form is making a grid out of it. So uh, I, I like the concept. I think it's a good form. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. John, send me an email. OK, you got to send me an email. Remind me what you want specifically. And I'll send you the, the whole uh, and that goes for everybody. I always send you my work product. I'm OK with that. Um, so anyway, that's my TEC form, um, and I'm happy to share my library with you uh, so that you're you're uh, you know what's going on, okay? Because that's kind of important. I kind of want everybody to know what's going on. But remember again, the point here is that the the buyer's agent it's incumbent on the buyer's agent to add the T T O P A, um, and then one thing I did not show you that I meant to show you. Um, uh, oh shoot, I, I, I closed it uh, on the uh, T O P A form. Uh, where did it go? Oh, I completely changed everything I was doing. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to go try to find it. Uh, um, all right. Anyway, so uh, um, back to my uh, PowerPoint. So uh, I closed the TOPA and I shouldn't have. I always I always know I'm going to regret it when I close the document. So anyway, it says here that the seller shall disclose to the buyer if occupied by tenants or persons other than the seller over here on the left and attach TOP and a counter offer if the buyer's agent didn't include it. All right. And then again, as I said earlier, if you were the seller's agent, I would get that tenant estoppel certificate, the TEC form signed at the time of the listing by the tenant, because that says here's the lease, the whole lease 
uh, nothing but the lease so help me God, right? Uh, signed by the tenant, signed by the owner of the property. Best to get that out of the way now um, rather than trying to get it from the tenant after they realize they're going to be moving in a week, right? Because then they don't want to give it to you uh, and and you need to have that. I, I have uh, had scenarios where the deposit was $1,200 and then of course the tenant stays on in the property and then tells the, the new owner that the, it was $12,000. So, you know, those are kind of crazy things we see in some of this stuff, okay? So that being said, uh, closing occupancy and possession. So again, this is just a, a, a reiteration of what is set up there on the TOPA. The unit, so the um, if the buyer intends to occupy as, sec as primary or secondary, uh, uh, the unit buyer intends to occupy shall be vacant at the time of possession is delivered to the buyer. And if the property contains more than one unit within three days after acceptance, buyer shall tell the seller in writing which unit they intend to occupy. Okay, that's kind of important. Um, occupancy may may impact available financing. Obviously, uh, non-owner loan, you know, everybody wants to get an owner-occupied loan because it's got lower interest rate, you know, less down payment requirement, et cetera, et cetera. Seller shall disclose to buyer if occupied by tenants or persons other than the seller and attach the TOPA if not part of the buyer's offer. That's a restatement of what we just saw a second ago. Okay, so in summary, it applies to occupancy other than by the seller. Okay, everybody good with that? Good. Okay, if not included with the original offer. Serves as a reminder of the affirmative duty of the seller to disclose, and then the unit the buyer intends to occupy is to be vacant. And so buyer needs to tell them that they intend to occupy a unit, and then the seller uh, needs to make an attempt to do that. If they're unable to do that, then then uh, then we have a different dance that we're going to apply to. So if it's a residential one to four, the buyer is going to identify the unit that they intend to occupy. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Q18. So um, uh, 3Q18, as we say. So 3Q18 is my home warranty plan. So this is what it looked like before. Um, home warranty plan, uh, seller to pay for it, perhaps. Um, the Fidelity National Home Warranty is just an example. Um, we want to make sure we name the plan, okay? So um, so much like title, much like escrow, much like natural hazard <coughs> disclosure, excuse me, um, you want to provide the buyer with a choice of three. So um, we have an approved vendor list. <coughs> we have three of each profession in there. Uh, we give them all to the buyer. We tell them, <coughs> we say, uh, um, you know, uh, here's here's the list. Take a look. These are the ones we've done business with. It's not a guarantee, not a warranty, um, but uh, we seem to have had good results with them. So give your buyer, you never want to give them only one because then, then you have what we refer to as a, a potential for negligent referral. Um, I had a lawsuit where uh, that uh, never went to trial, of course, um, where the uh, uh, seller's agent countered the National Hazard Disclosure Company. Uh, and uh, um, it turned out that the Natural Hazard Disclosure Company uh, misidentified the property to be not in a zone when in fact it was in a zone and as the courts have said you can't move the property out of the zone so the damages for relief are usually going to be for the cost of the property so and eh, so be careful about that so here's what the old document said here's what the new document says so the new document says home warranty plan chosen by buyer okay not you know not by seller chosen by buyer. Now, I still have agents countering uh, the home warranty plan. It's like it says chosen by buyer, not by seller, right? Coverage includes, but it's not limited to. You always know lawyers are writing it whenever it says something like that. So if you're going to put anything in there at all, you don't really have to, because the bottom line is over on the right-hand side, if seller checked, seller's cost not to exceed. So what does that mean? It puts a cap on the seller's contribution to the home warranty. So now obviously if the buyer's box is checked, you, there's nothing to fill out on the right-hand side because that's only applies if the seller's box is checked. If the seller's box, if both is checked, by the way, the contract says it is split equally. So in either scenario, seller's checked or both is checked, then the paragraph on the right limits the seller's uh, obligation to contribute. So cost not to exceed a certain figure. And then again, put in the issued by the company issued by. Obviously, in this case, I didn't wasn't able to mirror that because this is the uh, red line version of the form. Um, OK, um, again, I'll send you the red line versions if you want. But you got to tell me what you want. I, the, the folder is pretty good size. OK, all right. So that's paragraph three, uh, Q18. And then here's the reference to it in the actual contract. Buyers shall choose the home warranty plan and any optional coverages 
buyer shall pay any cost of that plan chosen by the buyer that exceeds the amount seller uh, allocated to the seller. So the seller agreed to pay $750 and the plan is $850. The buyer costs up the other $100. It's a fascinating thing that, that for all the decades that I've been in real estate and worked with purchase agreements and things like that, it just fascinates me that we never covered you know, who pays for that difference. So I've always told the uh, buyer that uh, if it turns out to be more, then they're going to be expected to, to pay pay that difference. And then finally, CAR actually put it in the contract. So, uh, you know, and but I go back to this contract, right? So I always love bringing this up, right? The one page purchase agreement. Uh, when I started in real estate, this was it. This was the contract. So, and it says contract. It doesn't say purchase agreement. It says contract. And it says receipt for deposit, not and joint escrow instructions. So, uh, John, I'll send you this too, if you want it. I actually have the original on the desk behind me. I, th I think I'm going to have it bronzed and put up on the wall. Um, but but the reason we have a 16 page contract today, folks, is because of paragraph number one right there. This is where we were waxing eloquent. This is where we were giving legal advice to people. Uh, and uh, this is where we wrote all of our stuff. And, and can you believe it all fit in there? But, you know, leave it to the lawyers. Now we got to have 16 pages of stuff because whenever we write stuff, it's no longer a standard form. And so remember, the Department of Real Estate says by virtue of your real estate license, you are able to explain the standard form. OK. All right. Uh, so uh, this is the rest of it here. Notice in the lower uh, left hand corner, I think, uh, is the uh, copyright 1971 by the California Association of Realtors. By the way, not much longer before that, it was the California Board of Realtors. Uh, and then over on the right hand side, some of you are probably not old enough to know that NCR stood for National Cash Register, which was the name of the company that actually came out with the forms. OK, everybody good with that? Cool stuff, huh? All right. So let's go uh, make that go away. Uh, let me see here. So then I've got my uh, realtor acknowledgement form, which we just voted um, uh, in, in professional standards uh, at CAR to have this included in your in your template whenever you write an offer. So this is the form. It's had some amendments to it. I hope you're using it currently. Uh, it's an excellent form. It used to be that page one just said it's a crime. Uh, it's a, a violation of business and professions code 101. Uh, 77E to call yourself a realtor if in fact you aren't. So page one always had that that big bold print warning uh, out there. And, and it's interesting, they don't even reference it in here. Although I did the class this morning on, uh, on lawsuit avoidance and I, I showed everybody uh, the civil code, uh, the, I'm sorry, the BMP code that addressed it. So anyway, that's your RA form. Um, and then uh, I'll address some things with the RPA in a minute, but uh, we'll go back to... Uh, the PowerPoint, if I can find it. Okay, so here we go. So um, buyers inform the home warranty plans have many optional coverages, of course, including but not limited to coverages for air, pool, spa. Buyers advise to investigate these coverages to determine those that may be suitable for the buyer and their cost. Uh, if the buyer waives the plan, they can still purchase the, the a plan uh, at their expense now uh, prior to closings. In other words, you didn't make it part of a contract uh, prior to closing. I don't know. In my experience, I've been able to purchase them after closing. So, um, you know, but and at the same uh, uh, price, home warranty plans lose money the first year. Uh, their goal is to make up for it with the renewals. Uh, I know because I'm paying them on several houses uh, and I'm not getting a break. So uh, that being said, uh, in summary, the home warranty buyer chooses the plan and the coverage. Only the seller's costs are capped, not the buyer's cost. Uh, the buyer pays the excess. OK, all right. Let's let's talk about uh, paragraph 12B2. Um, and, and this is important um, because the contract has changed. So uh, and you know that when you look at your CR form, uh, in fact, uh, Oh my goodness, I'm, I thought for sure I was going to get you out of here early. I still think I can, but but let's go to the um, uh, my CR form. Let me see, uh, add, and let's do uh, a CR, and this will be the CRB, right? Because now we have the, the uh, whoops, no, it doesn't like uh, CRB, uh, hyphen B. Oh, there we go, contingency removal. So I'm going to take a look at my buyer contingency removal form. Uh, and uh, where is it? It's going to be down. Well, let's get rid of 10 occupied. Okay. And so this is my buyer removal contingency. So here's what I want to call out for you. This is incredibly important. So right here under paragraph number two, buyer removes only the following individually checked buyer contingencies. When I look down here to paragraph 2C, investigation of property, and in investigation of property, they can remove the entire thing or only part uh, related to inspections 
or all of their investigations. That includes insurability. So remember that insurability was not a, a, a contingency in our contract in previous contracts. It is now. So be very careful in removing these contingencies. And so um, we could do uh, uh, 2C4, all of the buyer's investigation contingency except fire insurance, flood insurance, whatever. Be very careful about how you check this form and fill the form out. Remember, once the buyer removes a the contingency, they can't get it back. And that's going to be very, very important. OK, so be aware of how to fill that form out. Uh, check with your broker. Uh, you can always call me. I'm probably just going to ask you a bunch of questions that are going to lead you to the answer. And so, you know, my favorite time of year is depositions. So uh, uh, I'm getting pretty good at it. So uh, investigation of any matter, uh, any other matter affecting the property, other than those that are specified as separate contingencies, Buyer investigations include, but are not limited to, an investigation of the availability and cost of general homeowners insurance, flood insurance, and fire insurance. See the buyer's investigation advisory. Again, that was a change that CAR finally made. It used to be the buyer's inspection advisory. Fortunately, same initials. Now they change the word inspection to investigation, which is what it is. Buyer's obligation is to investigate. Your obligation is to inspect. Okay, everybody with me? So very, very important. People say, well, what's the, why is that a big deal? Insurance isn't that much. Well, it, it could very well be that the property has had uh, so many claims on it that you can, that, you, know, you can always get insurance, right? But you don't want to be buying insurance from some of these companies that you can't go anywhere else but this company. And, and the cost of that policy, the lender is going to factor that into the monthly payment, uh, and it may preclude the buyer from getting the loan. So uh, be careful about removing the contingency uh, without uh, double checking with the, uh, make sure that the buyer, the buyer very early in the transaction needs to talk to their insurance company. Remember their insurance company can run the clue report, uh, find out if there've been any uh, uh, claims against the property. Um, I've got one right now where the, uh, there were several claims against the property. Buyer, pro uh, seller produced receipts for $2,500. And so there was in fact $78,000 worth of uh, claims. And so, uh, you know, that's the the uh, buyer's job is to find those things out. Okay. All right. That being said, uh, here's the new language. So um, uh, items that do come under buyer investigations include, but are not limited to investigation of the availability and cost of general homeowner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Uh, <clears throat> in summary, we removed paragraph three, uh, number three for seller's docs, uh, reminder for flood, fire, and other insurance. So again, paragraph number three uh, was seller's docs on the contingency removal form. Okay. All right. Um, assignment nomination, uh, strangely enough. Uh, assignment and nomination. So we added the word nomination because actually at law, there is a difference between the two. Um, so what we did was we redefined everything so it all fit under this this uh, bag of everything that we're going to call the assignment. So uh, that's the old language. Um, here is the change to the language. I didn't do the whole thing all over again. <clears throat> uh, party shall. So starting off with right down here where it says party shall. Now it says party shall provide uh, any assignment agreement to escrow holder uh, within one day after the assignment. Uh, any nomination by the buyer shall be subject to the same procedure. It looks like that's the same thing again. So uh, CAR said this was a change to the contract. It really isn't, uh, but uh, it is the language that they want to highlight. So uh, so now that assignment agreement within a day, a nomination subject to all the same stuff as the above. So we just redefined it so that it all fit in this bucket. Okay, everybody good? All right. In summary, uh, made uh, the assignee and the nominee the same for purchases of the agreement, parties to provide assignment to escrow within one day after the assignment, okay? So uh, um, so again, the, the by default in the purchase agreement, the buyer usually has uh, 17 days. Um, our purchase agreement has zero days because we want to know if we're writing an offer for the buyer, we want to know, are you going to sign this contract to somebody and we're going to call you out on it? We're going to put zero in there. And if that's not going to work for you, you need to let us know. So we, we kind of have a, a we feel like we have an affirmative duty to find out from the buyer whether they are the ultimate uh, closer of the transaction. So but but whatever, what, at whatever point the buyer uh, uh, does their assignment they have to give a copy to escrow within a day after they uh, they exercise that right, assuming it's under the, uh, exercising the right under the contract. Now, any any questions about any of that? 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, what we refer to as the broker box, and this is going to be the broker signature section. And so this is the way it looked before. Um, this is the way it looks now. So we have changed it. We have added the full address uh, for the brokers. Notice there's no address up here. Um, I'm sorry, there is one down there. I don't know why we did this. Uh, we did, oh, we moved it up to the top to give it more room. Um, and then we've also done the uh, designated electronic delivery addresses, check all that apply. Uh, and uh, up here it said delivery shall be made to the alternate uh, designated electronic delivery address only. So this one is uh, check all that apply. We made that change uh, partially because um, we we knew that uh, we if if you don't fill in the document, then we're going to need the DEDA form, which is the designated electronic delivery address uh, form. So that's CAR form DEDA. Um, so we want to try to get that covered here. Now you'll notice when you write your offer, you don't have the ability to fill that information in for the seller's agent. The seller's agent fills in their own information, um, uh, whether or not they're going what their designated electronic uh, delivery address is going to be. Everybody okay with that? Uh, and then once again, full address, uh, and then the other information down here at the bottom. Uh, and again, to be filled out by the seller's agent, not by the buyer's agent on behalf of the seller's agent. So in summary, full contact information for each broker uh, and uh, simplified designated electronic delivery address paragraph. Again, if we don't get that part right, and I frequently see it not filled in, um, if we don't get that part right, then we're going to um, we're going to need to use the DEDA form. OK, um, so let's take a look at paragraph four. Now, paragraph four. So paragraph three was the first three pages of the contract. And now we're going to leave that. And that's going to be the uh, the fill in the blank part of things. And, and thankfully, most of us have gotten used to that. Uh, I know when the grid first came out a couple of years ago, there was like panic in the streets. Um, and uh, it was interesting in my conversations with the attorneys, they thought there would be a lot more litigation as a result of it. But uh, what's ended up happening uh, is that we're not seeing more litigation as a result of it. We're seeing actually, I think, better clarity about things. But but um, as I said to the Department of Real Estate in my talk with them, um, the, the problem with us is that we think that we're done at the end of paragraph number three. Uh, but again, the contract is 16 pages long. So that means there's 13 pages that we didn't bother to discuss. So the, the paragraph number three, which comprises the bottom of page one, all of page two, all of page three, we need to be thorough with the buyer about going over that. But we also need to continue that thoroughness with pair, uh, pages number four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way through 16. We 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 have at the heading of paragraph number three, this, this contract has 16 pages. Uh, buyer and uh, I think it should say agents are advised to read all pages, uh, but uh, that's because uh, uh, a lot of times the agent hasn't read all the pages. Everybody okay with that? So uh, we move things around here. And part of the reason is, is that we wanted to make sure that you did use the TOPA where, wherever there was a, a tenant who was going to remain or not remain in the property. So this is the uh, new language. I didn't, I didn't uh, give you the old language. We just literally shuffled some of the uh, headings around. So whether the tenant's going to remain or not. So as I said earlier, folks, listen, I know the tenant's got the best of intentions. They're going to be out on Friday. Um, they, what do you do if they don't make it? Right. And so, uh, you know, I love the saying, you know, that real estate agents uh, have said frequently, which is we'll let escrow figure it out. Escrow doesn't want to fix our problems. <laughs> the, thing, the things that we create, you know, it's like, well, we'll let escrow figure out what the names of the parties are. It's like, no, no, no. They want you to figure that out at the time of the contract. I had a, an offer by a, a flipper the other day. And so, uh, the offer said, uh, uh, seller's name was owner of record. And, and so I called him up. And I said, do you want to correct your contract? And he says, why? I says, you've got owner of record. And, and so that creates an ambiguity in the contract, which means that you don't have a contract. If, if you've got the buyer signs it and the seller's name is not there, then, you know, depending on how the seller signs it, um, you know, technically speaking, you don't have a contract. It's supposed to be a contract between the buyer and the seller. You've got owner of record. So you actually need to look up the owner of record. And of course, he yells at me and he says, I've got hundreds of these out. And I go, and I've never had a problem with it before. And I said, well, you, you never handle somebody like me, I guess, right? Somebody that actually knows what the contract says and what it's supposed to say. So you've been getting away with it. I guess that works for you. Um, I, 
again, uh, we're not going to do it unless you fix it. So it's just, it just is what it is. So, and then ultimately uh, they did fix it. And ultimately the deal didn't come together anyway, because they were way too far apart. Uh, so, so anyway, tenant occupied property addendum moved up to the top of the queue. Um, probate agreement purchase addendum, the, uh, again, not agreement, but addendum, because we only need the original agreement. Um, and then uh, manufactured house, uh, manufactured home purchase, uh, tenancy in common, stock co-op, uh, mixed use purchase uh, addendum. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that when these, that when we first started doing these things, people, you know, they were, they were saying, well, we never use those things. What are those? And, well, if you're doing a lot of transactions downtown San Diego, you're using them, right? Because we have properties that fit those, those those equations. We have properties out in uh, Escondido that fit uh, part of these equations as well. So, um, but there, but remember, this is a statewide form. So there are part, uh, parts of California where you're going to see this more commonly than others. So again, we move the TOPA to the top of the list, so more likely to be used. Uh, should be checked whether uh, current tenants will remain or not. Um, let's take a look at uh, what happens in paragraph number five. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I, I had a broker call me the other day. So I think we've made it very clear over the many years now that we don't do pass throughs. Um, and so a pass through being, uh, you know, the money, I've, I've heard a million things, the money goes hard, uh, it is uh, redirected to the seller, the buyer's deposit is given to the seller, um, that it just was a way we did things. And uh, unfortunately, we got into a bad habit, right? I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it's one of those things that you can't unring, you give the seller, the, the buyer gives the seller $100,000 of their deposit to show how serious they are. And of course, they're always going to say it's because we told them to do that uh, and uh, and then something goes wrong. So uh, we had an agent in our office who is not with us anymore, um, who uh, owned a property in uh, Santa Luz and the buyer came to them and said, I really, really, really want to buy this house. And so uh, the seller, of course, you know, who was one of our agents, uh, you know, said, uh, I want to sell it to them. They want to give me $250,000. And I said, no. Um, and they said, why not? Well, because, you know, we don't do that. Um, and, and that was before this language, by the way. Um, I said, we don't do that. And she says, why not? And I says, well, because it creates liability for all of us. Um, seller goes off and spends the money, which I know you're going to do. Um, and uh, then you don't have it to give back to the buyer in the event the buyer is entitled to re receive a return on their deposit. Remember that a lot of things can happen in a real estate transaction that would cause the buyer to be able to rescind the contract, which means put the parties back in the position they were in prior to contract, in which case that means that they've got to get their money back. OK, now that's a rescission right goes to statute. Versus a contractual, you know, a cancellation right, which goes to a contract. So like like um, the uh, TDS is statutory. Uh, you don't give it to the buyer for two weeks. Well, they already gave you the money. You got to give it back. Right. If the buyer decides not to go through because they got the TDS two weeks into the transaction. Um, different than the SPQ and the SPQA. Those are contractual. We can fight about those things, but we can't fight about statutory. Right. OK, so uh, so in that scenario, I had her contact a, 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 a very good real estate attorney in uh, Rancho Santa Fe. I said, you know, call this guy up and tell him what, uh, ask him what he thinks. He comes back with a five page option agreement which is what it is. Whenever we're passing money through, we're giving an option to the buyer to be able to purchase the property at a, at a time later on in the future. And so I'm not writing that. We used to write them, right? That was just something what we did. We used to have, we, in fact, we still have, I believe, an option agreement. I, uh, I wouldn't write one today. I, the last one I wrote, I think, was in 1984. Uh, I wouldn't write one today, um, but people do. So, okay, you do whatever your broker tells you to do. Now, when I look at this agreement, I look at paragraph number three, and I see in paragraph number three, this is the old language, uh, paragraph 29, which is, of course, uh, liquidated damages, if initial by all parties or otherwise incorporated in this agreement, specifies a remedy for buyer's default. Okay, buyer and seller are advised to consult with a QCREA. We coined this term a year and a half ago, qualified California real estate attorney. Listen, I know when I'm talking to an attorney, whether or not they're a real estate attorney, they're, this language is just going to roll off their lips and I'm going to know I'm talking to somebody who knows what they're doing. All right. Uh, before adding any other clause specifying a remedy such as release or forfeiture of the deposit or making a deposit non-refundable. So again, non-refundable deposit, pass through, 
deposit goes hard, you know, you call whatever you want to call it, okay? Um, for failure buyer to complete the purchase, all right? Any such clause shall be deemed invalid unless the clause independently satisfies the statutory liquidated damages requirement that are set forth in the civil code. So does so are you going to write a document that will satisfy that requirement? This isn't it. This uh, liquidated damages provision applies only to the initial deposit. It does not apply to later deposits, okay? All right. Um, and by the way, I asked you the question, are you going to go ahead and create that paragraph or that uh, language? No, that's legal advice, right? It's not a standard form. Liquidated damages, uh, the uh, receipt for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, delivery of increased deposit, the DID, it used to be the RID, but we don't take deposits. So um, that form addresses whether or not liquidated damages will apply to the new monies that are coming in later, right? That's okay. That, I get that, but there's nothing in there that says the seller gets the money. Okay. Now, so, so again, I've given you a couple of scenarios of what could possibly go wrong. I got a really good one for you here in a minute. Um, so uh, um, regarding possible liability and remedies, if the buyer fails to deliver the deposit in the first place, right? Uh, so, so we don't have the ability to write that language. It is clearly legal advice. Okay. Remember DRE says you, the, by virtue of your license, you may explain the standard form. This language the, you, is a separate form that you're going to create. That's not uh, something that you're allowed to do that. You need an attorney for that. Just like I, I sent that, uh, that uh, uh, seller off to an attorney who, who, uh, you know, came back surprised the heck out of her five pages. Right. I mean, it's, it's not a simple issue. So, so let me, let me, let me, posit something to you. So um, broker uh, has the funds released from the buyer's deposit to the seller. Um, uh, there's a release. There's not just one, there's two. So there's two pass-throughs that occur in the transaction. I'm just making this up, okay? Um, and then guess what happens? The day before transaction closes, the buyer dies. Oh my goodness. Okay. The buyer passes away. What do you do? Well, the seller thinks they owe, they have the money, right? What do you do? And the, the bottom line is they do have the money, but do they have to give it back? And unfortunately, lawyers start circling, right? They start doing their little dance and all that kind of stuff. And so you're sitting right there in the middle of it. Do, they, you did something completely inconsistent with what paragraph number uh, uh, 5A3 says. Okay. So we don't want to do that. Um, but but the scenario at, at that point is, um, you know, had, had the buyer removed all their contingencies, you know, all those kinds of things. Should the seller uh, seller provide a demand to close escrow? You know, who knows, right? You need to talk to an attorney about that, okay? Especially when we're talking about a sizable amount of money. Is everybody okay with that? Um, that's what that paragraph says. And I bring that up because we changed the paragraph, but we only changed a couple little things in there, right? So, so even this little I, I don't understand. It's, it's the same as up here. And then down here, and regarding possible liability and remedies if the buyer, uh, if the buyer fails uh, to deliver the deposit in the first place, okay? So they reiterated that poor uh, that portion of the purchase agreement. I like the fact that it's in red because, you know, this is the kind of thing that a lot of us did, just didn't jump out at us because when we got 16 pages to read and it's all black and white, you know, we don't know what we're looking for. That's why we look at that red line version. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, uh, because real estate agents just continue to do pass throughs, uh, non-refundability of deposits, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, uh, I just think it's an inherent problem. I think that uh, as we uh, move along, imagine the fear. If somebody calls me on the phone and says, this is what I did. And, and I'm like, wow, you really need to talk to an attorney. Uh, you know, and, and they don't want to hear that. They think I'm going to give them legal advice. I can't give you legal advice, right? I'm not an attorney. Uh, you know, I can give you practitioner's advice. And as a practitioner's advice, I tell you not to do that. It's just like, okay, well, I knew you were going to say that. They always say that too. They always, they always go, I knew you were going to say that. Okay, well, then why'd you do it? All right, let's talk about window coverings, uh, including hardware and rods. I've got one right now where the seller took off with everything. Okay, so there's the current language. Here's the new language. So we added and any associated hardware and rods. We, we added that in there, uh, even though it's uh, over here. 
um, uh, and we added pool heaters and and uh, and all that. So those were things that we and I have one right now where they took off with all the hardware, took off with all the rods, took off with the the knobs on the dresser drawers, and took off with the pool heater. And <laughs> it's like who takes off with the pool heater? Like you're going to buy a property with a pool that takes that specific heater? So. Anyway, I'll let you know how that one turns out. <laughs> okay. Uh, needed to address hardware issues, et cetera, because sellers were taking off uh, with them. And interestingly enough, I sold a house, uh, gosh, back in Carlsbad in, in the uh, 80s uh, to uh, the uh, my buyer was uh, owned St. Mary Cement Company. And I had the same scenario happen. The seller took off with everything, matching window coverings that match the, the comforters and all that kind of stuff. And the buyer was so disappointed. And I said, well, here's a list of attorneys that I like to use. Uh, and uh, ultimately, they just kind of got their own stuff. But, you know, who takes off with that stuff? You're looking for windows that are exactly the same dimensions, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, all right, I get it. Um, OK, so moving forward, um, delisting personal devices. And so uh, paragraph 9B5. Uh, interesting. So so currently we have uh, non-dedicated. So we have dedicated devices. Obviously, those got to stay right, because, you know, if I, if I have a, that box on the living room table that says, you know, open and close the curtains, turn the lights on and off, you know, dedicated to that feature. That's very different than what I have on my phone, which is, you know, my phone does a lot of things, by the way. OK, and so, uh, you know, my phone uh, and I've, I've trained Linda over the years to be able to have her phone. Uh, you know, she's figured out how to do it, too. So she turns the air on, turns the air off. You know, she has a personal summer. So, you know, uh, you know, up comes the air conditioning and it's 33 degrees outside and she's got the air going anyway. God love her. But but she's figured out how to do all that stuff. And so um, she uh, she had a home, um, a large home. I set the whole thing up with, you know, all the stuff, right? The the, the Nest thermostats, the um, the uh, the lights. I can turn every light in the house on with the push of a button. I can turn them on and off in zones. I can dim them. I can brighten them. I can raise the window cutter. I can do all this stuff, right? So imagine she goes and she buys another house. Of course, you know, silly me, I do it all again in the, in the next house, all right? Because because you know, Linda thinks that I, I have all that stuff so that uh, she will be safe when she walks into the room. All the lights come on, so you know that she can see her way around the room. She doesn't have to go fumbling for switches or anything like that. And if you want help, I'll, I'll, I'll give you you know on, on a sidebar here. I'll, I'll tell you you know uh, what I use. But uh, anyway, it's a great little feature. Um, but she's figured out that you know, she 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 thinks I did all that so that she would be safe. And the, the fact of the matter is that I did all that so that it would also after she left the room, they would turn the lights off. You know, because I was getting tired of these three hundred dollars utility bills you know this tiny little house uh so uh and now i've got my ai over there trying to look up what i just talked about so so anyway um it turns the lights off when she leaves the room well now here's the deal so she puts a tenant in the house previous house moves into the new house okay and so from the new house she still has all the controls on her phone to the old house. So, so this is what this paragraph talks about. I've got, I'm going to delist devices. So I went to my phone, her phone. I disconnected the thermostat. I disconnected the alarm system. I, I disconnected the uh, lighting system, all that stuff. Now I can always get that put back on again. You know, just got to go ahead and it, it, assuming that she ever goes back to that house, I doubt it, but uh, um, you know, I can redo all that stuff. But for now, imagine the tenant at two o'clock in the morning, every light and the house comes on, the music starts blaring and all kinds of stuff. That would be very inconvenient and also, I think, an invasion of privacy, right? So the tenant is not expecting that. Well, imagine you sell a house to somebody. That person is expecting that when you sell them the house, they're, you're done with the house. Go away. Bye-bye. You take it with you and, and disconnect all of those things that are on your on your phone, okay? All right, so you're gonna delist any devices from any personal accounts and cooperate with a transfer of services. So what I tell the, what I usually tell the seller to do is reset the passcode to zeros, right? And then uh, we'll just give the buyer the zeros and the buyer can create their own passcode and do their own kind of thing, okay? That makes sense? So the seller doesn't want them to have their passcode. Or, oh, it's your birthday. I mean, it's like, come on, right? So. Uh, um, anyway, buyers advised to change all passwords, ensure the security of any smart home features. And so the new language, you know, again, uh, still has uh, uh, the that, that same thing in there, uh, delist, uh, 
any devices, see this says shall delist uh, any devices from any personal accounts and shall cooperate with any transfer of services to the buyer, okay? And then the new, uh, and then of course the buyer's advisor change all the passwords, okay? Everybody good with that? Um, important that the seller disassociate their non-dedicated device, a device. And so again, I don't want Linda, you know, turning the lights on in the in the living room or family room, whatever it is, uh, um, thinking that she's turning it on in the house that she's in, but in fact, she's turning it on in the house that, that she was in. And so we don't wanna do that, okay? Um, especially because we respect the tenants, they're good people. All right, after title is transferred to the buyer. Um, then we talk about our allocation of costs again. This is uh, one of the changes. So uh, uh, we're not even at 11M yet, but allocation of costs, inspection reports, tests and certificates. And so the new language, um, uh, and it looks like a lot of this uh, must have copied the current contract uh, because this is the same language that we have in the, uh, well, actually, no, it's not. So uh, what changed in here uh, in any such document? Yep, that's in there. Uh, any reports in these paragraphs shall be delivered in the time specified. So it looks like um, the same. Uh, it, it's it, obviously I've copied the current contract, which uh, the the bottom part has the uh, red line version of it to show you what the changes were. OK. All right. That being said, some minor adjustments to font. Um, <clears throat> I think that, that, that that's a, uh, an invasive problem. So here, this font is obviously very different than this font. And part of that has to do that with when they uh, create the new contract, they use the old one kind of as a form, and then they copy paste a bunch of stuff around. And so as time has gone on, the fonts have been different. Uh, and so that was uh, very clearly a problem with the new contract in 20, uh, 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 2022 when we revised the RPA for the first time. Um, okay, uh, solar, <clears throat> excuse me, solar power system. So um, I finally, you know, CAR put this in their, um, in their, uh, you know, edits that they were going to be doing in the new forms because the old form said solar systems. And so I was constantly giving them a hard time about the fact that I didn't know we were selling, you know, Mercury and, and, and Venus and Pluto. Well, Pluto is arguably a satellite, um, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, you know, we were selling solar systems. We were selling the Milky Way, you know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so finally they, I had to send them an email. If you can even believe this. So uh, the language is almost the same, except for over here, solar system, over here, solar system. So when I look at the new stuff, I see solar power systems. They said they were going to do it, and then they just forgot. Okay. And so, you know, I love CAR, you know, and so uh, I, I, I speak with them frequently. Like, for example, there's a, a an error in the new RPO uh, D form. Um, it, it has military ordinance, and ordinance has an I in it. And, and John, you would agree with me that there is no I in ordinance. Ordinance, ordinance is stuff that goes boom. Uh, and so they've misspelled it. So an ordinance is a rule or regulation. Uh, and so uh, it just, I see these things as I'm teaching classes and I go, okay, I got to make a note to send that to them. I'll do that when I'm done with this uh, today. So, so anyway, they, they did finally change. Um, and now they have solar power systems. And then over here, solar power system. Okay. Again, it was something they knew they, they needed to change. And it was just, uh, it just got missed. That's all, you know, it's, it's no harm, no foul. Okay. Everybody good with that? We okay? That was one of my favorite. It was just kind of, it, every time I saw it, I went, ah. Anyway, so I finally had to do that. I'm still still boiling over the fact that uh, um, uh, relationship is misspelled in paragraph 2B. So in your purchase agreement in paragraph 2B, it says disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. Well, there is no S in the statute. So again, they've hired me in the past to come in and review to make sure that it was statutorily correct. And this is just something they haven't consulted with me on. I'll send that this afternoon too. I'll let them know it says relationships. It should say relationship. And of course, whenever I send something in, you know, either Neil Kalen contacts me, you know, calls me on the phone or Gov does. And, 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 and it's not knock it off kind of thing. It's like, all right, okay, I get it. Okay, everybody good? Okay, so we, we changed solar power to solar power systems, or I'm sorry, solar systems to solar power systems. Okay, um, let's talk about the definition of a legal holiday. So this is this is the way that he used to say, here's the way it, it says, uh, it says now. So legal holiday shall mean any holiday or optional bank holiday under civil code uh, sections seven and 7.1, any holiday under government code 6700. Okay, it should say and, but it doesn't. Okay, um, and, then, and then it says, 
uh, on or any day that the lender or escrow holder under this agreement is closed. Obviously, we can't record a document if the county's not uh, open at that time. If they're not there, they're there, but they're just not open at that time. So we really can't do anything. So so the um, the previous iteration of the contract, which was this way for you know, a very long time, um, it said it shall be the next day. And I remember reaching out to Neil and I said, uh, why doesn't it say the next business day? Because obviously, if you're if you do that 45 day, uh, you know, close of escrow be 45 days, which is a mistake, uh, a contract error, right? I mean, the, the law wants a date certain. So you should be hitting that drop down that gives you the calendar. You click on the date that you want it to close, not 30 days or 45 days. That's why we had to write all this language is because people were putting in there, you know, 30 days, 30, 45 days, whatever. And the problem is by the time the contract got put together, you know, the uh, so the, the date of seller's acceptance is considered zero, says it right up here. Uh, zero is a date for purposes of seller's acceptance. That means the next day is one, the next day is two, and that's when we start counting the days. So you've got this great big long paragraph because, you know, people just aren't getting it. So it's like, okay, so what, what does that mean? So what happens if it's, if you did 30 days and 30 days falls on a Saturday? Well, the contract says it shall be the next day. Well, it's not open on Sunday either. Right. And so that was my argument. Neil sends me back this. It was just brilliantly written. Uh, the legislative intent behind why it, the next day is the next business day. So obviously, you know, we're, we're coming up on the holidays. Uh, you know, uh, the county, I think on Friday, uh, next week is open for a half a day. Um, so uh, so if you try to close your if you did 30 days and is set up to close on Thanksgiving, then it shall be the next day. Good luck if you make that or or worse yet, it's set up to, to close on Wednesday, but they're not ready in time. And now it's going to be Thursday. Well, the buyer is probably not going to actually close the uh, the transaction until the following Monday. Um, so, but if they fund it on Wednesday, then that means they're paying interest for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So they're paying interest for six days. And then they come after you and they say, why did you get us into that situation? Why are we paying for interest for six days when we don't get the keys until Monday? OK, and so so the, the, my argument is click the date on the calendar and, and, and have that be the date for close of escrow. OK, so so I do not do I, I, I teach do not put in, uh, you know, 30 days or 45 days or something like that. Pick the date. Look at the calendar. It's got a drop down right there. You can't miss it. Click the drop down and then you've got it. OK, is everybody good with that? So, you know, but but all of this stuff, because, you know, a legal holiday. Now we got to define a legal holiday, you know, uh, and frankly, we're, let, why don't we just say the, the county's open and recorded. If it's not open, don't record it. If the lender's not open, then don't record it. You can't, you know, whatever. So that's that's how all that's going to work. Is everybody okay with that? It just seems like a lot of hoop to do. And and uh, I just wish it was, uh, you know, we would just be clearer about that. Okay. All right. So uh, 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 COE is considered day zero here for purposes of counting days. Uh, seller is for, allowed to remain in possession if permitted by the agreement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, uh, needed to be more clear about what constitutes a legal holiday. All right. Okay, so um, I get myself going because uh, again, remember there were there was a time not that long ago we talked in terms of hours. You know, seventy two hours. You know, forty eight hours. Um, we had to switch that, and even the Department of Real Estate did. So the Department of Real Estate has a rule that says that that uh, you must get all material, uh, um, anything material to transaction to your broker within three days. It used to say 72 hours, and now it says three days. Even the Department of Real Estate says we can't do it in terms of hours because then if that means it starts at two o'clock, then you're hanging on to it for uh, even another half an extra day. So now it's just days. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and that seller's acceptance is day zero for purposes of counting days. Um, not the date of the contract, the date of seller's acceptance. Remember, everything starts with the seller's acceptance. Okay. All right. The date prepared up at the top of the contract is merely for purposes of referencing which contract we're talking about. Okay. All right. Uh, sellers allow, uh, if sellers allowed to remain in possession, if applicable. Okay, um, electronic signatures. Now this one cracks me up, right? So this is one of those things where um, electronic copy, uh, so this is the old language. The new language says 
um, uh, it looks like the same thing as the current language. Uh, unless otherwise agreed, buyer and seller agree to, to the use of electronic signatures. Um, it didn't say that before. Uh, so we just kind of assumed everybody was using electronic signatures and we didn't have to explain it, but but we, we had to, add, to actually add that language because the, the parties have to agree that electronic signatures are binding on the parties. And so we added that language to it, okay? And so it's just kind of comical to me because the, um, you, you needed to have the agreement and we didn't have it in the agreement, but everybody just carried on as if it was. And so, uh, uh, you know, whatever that looks like. Okay. All right. Uh, some more font changes and oops, we forgot to mention that the buyer and seller agree to use electronic signatures. In other words, they're binding on the parties. Okay. So um, much like, uh, interestingly enough, let's see, is it in here? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I had this conversation with Linda about um, uh, counter signatures, right? So counter signatures, meaning, um, you know, the, the buyer signs one form, the seller signs the other form. Um, as long as the two forms are identical, they don't need to sign the same form. So, you know, the, the conversation came up with the PRBS, for example, buyer writes the offer, they've got their PRBS in there, it's signed by the buyer. Does the seller have to sign that PRBS? Well, no, because the seller signed one when they did their listing agreement. So I've got two documents that are identical, assuming they're both, you know, each of the agents was using the current forms. I can hold the two documents up to the light. That's what the law refers to as the light test. The light test, I can see through it. They're identical documents, except where the signatures are. I don't need to have them sign it again. Now, do I need to provide the other side with a copy of it? You could. I don't know that it's really required. Um, it already says in paragraph 2A of the RPA that you don't have to give, we don't have to share agency disclosures, even though when you sign your offer to purchase, when the buyer signs the offer to purchase, that agency disclosure that the buyer signs is going to go over automatically. But it says right in 2A that that there's no, no requirement for the seller to exchange it, no requirement for the buyer to exchange it. I certainly wouldn't want to have a file that didn't have it in there um, uh, if I was writing the offer for the buyer and I'm going to get one when I have when I take the listing with the seller that's all um, and I just wrote a great big long paper on uh, what we need to write uh, take a listing for you you know what what uh, information do we need to have so uh, uh, these are things that I was uh, pretty thorough about when I went through them so uh, any questions so far about any of this uh, me I, I forgot that was my cue to get a drink of water all right um, Oh, where did I put my trash can? Okay, uh, so uh, binding on the parties. All right, um, so uh, for the lawyers, uh, I think this is interesting, right? So um, uh, again, God, it looks like these are all the same thing. But uh, uh, so the new language that we inserted was in under pres preservation of action. So you all know that, uh, hopefully you know, that if a, a party commences a lawsuit, um, without uh, attempting mediation first, or if asked, not agreeing to mediation, um, then, uh, and, and the party is uh, later on doesn't have, uh, you know, doesn't prevail, then uh, they may have to pay their own attorney's fees, you know, all those kinds of things. So this says um, that the, the attorneys can file the list pendants, the lawsuit pending, um, provided that at the same time or immediately afterwards, they make a request to the court for a stay of litigation, okay? And so that's pending any applicable mediation or arbitration proceeding. So we actually had to write that in there because you you filed the lawsuit to toll the time period. So the time period stopped, but unfortunately you filed a lawsuit. And so you didn't attempt mediation, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to clarify that language. So we, we spun that around a little bit and we said, we're only filing the lawsuit to preserve our right but we're now we're going to file the mediation or the uh, the mediation, not the arbitration, because mediation is the default language in the purchase agreement. So technically speaking, um, you probably don't want to have an arbitration proceeding in there. You want to have the mediation because remember, mediation is the default. Everybody has to at least attempt mediation, um, and then after that attempt or not, and and I've been involved in, in mediation where um, I had a uh, I, I litigated against a, a developer of a, a unit that I owned in, in Del Mar. And there was uh, invasive uh, water damage to the property. I mean, I even had Statue Botrys, you know, it was uh, had all the uh, OSHA and the EPA people in there. Uh, anyway, I filed a lawsuit against the uh, uh, the uh, 
homeowners association at the time. And, and, and believe it or not, uh, we all walked into the mediation. I'll never forget it. Uh, we walked into the mediation. I've got my attorneys, they've got their attorneys. We walked in mediator looks at us, says, you know, each of you hand me a check for two fifty, whatever it was. Uh, and, uh, and then the next question was, are y'all going to agree to mediate? And we all said, no. Uh, and, and so that was all we had to do. We just had to show up. Now, I don't know if that's the same rule today, but we made an attempt, everybody showed up and then we went straight to court. Right. So, because I didn't have a contract with the HOA and there wasn't anything in their documents written in 1960 that said that I had to subject myself to arbitration. So we went to court. Um, and uh, obviously, I was successful in court. Um, uh, and, and part of the reason was the same thing with a farmer's case in Texas, you know, where it just took them so long to respond. And I ended up paying for all this work. Uh, it ended up costing them three times what it would cost if they just gotten involved in it and, and helped me pay for it at the time. But uh, I thought it was a sad statement, but it, but it was what it was. Um, I also had a, another mediation in uh, Orange County where where the seller was being sued by the buyer. Um, and uh, I sat down with the uh, the mediator uh, and and within, I happened to be there, I was a precipient witness. So the seller is in there, I'm in there, the, the uh, mediator is in there and he's a second year law student. Uh, and so uh, we started, you know, you know, how's the weather, you know, lovely balloons today, you know, things like that. Uh, and then he says, uh, I get the sense that you kind of probably know more about this than I do <laughs> because it was a real estate related thing. I go, I might. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, I'm here to attempt to get you to mediate. And I said, OK. And he said, you're not going to mediate, are you? I said, no. <laughs> he says, OK, we're done. We got up. We went into court. Uh, and uh, it was a very brief uh, trial. Uh, so uh, uh, needless to say, the seller prevailed in that trial. But no, I'm not mediating that. That was an easy one. That was just such an easy case. But but again, I was in charge of that uh, for the uh, the seller. The seller happened to be my uh, daughter. So it was, you know, so it was just kind of a mistake for the buyer to do what they did. But they did. OK. All right. Anyway, so enough stories. Um, so that's uh, 31C. Uh, again, some more font changes, um, but also that the parties agree that the filing of the action, otherwise known as a list pendens, okay, Latin list pendens, um, merely to toll the statute is merely to toll the statute of limitations. Okay, so in order to file later for mediation or arbitration. So and that's a wrap on the new RPA. I'm going to get you out of here a couple minutes early, but I want to tell you a couple of things. And John, don't go anywhere. Hang on. So three things to remember. One, your forms library. So when we update the library, which we are going to do in, uh, let me see here. Let's get this to go here. I'm going to back out of this. No, I'm not going to save it. So when we update, and again, as I've always said, I am more than happy to share uh, the happiness that I bring to the world. Uh, I have created templates. I have a seller listing, the buyer offer, property management templates, lease templates. I have all these templates. Um, and so please don't send me an email that says send me all your templates because I'm not going to respond to that. But uh, if you want a template, I will send it to you. But we create templates for everything. Why? Because when CAR updates the forms, uh, they will update the forms in the library December, roughly the 23rd of December, they will update the forms. And again, as I showed you in the very beginning, they've taken all the forms that they are currently redlining off of the website. They're going to, they're doing their thing and then they'll put them all back uh, and bonk as we've seen all at one time. So, um, so I am more than happy to send you my templates. Okay. And that's my offer to you. Um, I usually charge for this. I usually charge $500 for this. Um, but uh, you ask for it. I will send them to you. Um, the good news is they're only good for another month, right? Because, uh, you know, we're going to update the templates next year or next month. So, um, but, but they're a pretty good start. So if you, so again, we will update the forms in the library. We will also update your template. So we will, we will update the forms in your template. So they'll have the current version, you know, 1223, right? For those forms that are 1223, we will not add new forms. So uh, at the end of last year, when we eliminated the buyer representation agreement, it disappeared out of my buyer offer template, but they did not put in the BRBC. I had to go in and manually do it. Now, fortunately, I knew what the forms were. Again, wait for that class. If SDAR does not have me do that class, I'm going to do it as a podcast. Um, and so that uh, that's the other thing I wanted to tell you about. 
Um, now, the, the, the uh, other thing is, so we'll update the forms library, uh, we'll update your templates, we will not add new forms to your templates. And then finally, if you are copying transactions, then take, instead of copying it, because now you're using the old forms, right? Anytime you, you go past a, a revision period, then you want to uh, uh, save it as a template, okay? So save your, you know, and I did this class last week, I thought it was a really good class, I showed you how to do all of this stuff. So you'll copy the transaction. And uh, 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 if you're copying transactions, save it as a template. You really loved what you did. So let's save it as a template and then apply that template to new transactions. OK. All right. So um, as I always say, when you define your duty, you limit your liability. So I want to make sure we're very clear about that. All right. If you'd like to view any of the previous webinars, please visit our new YouTube website. So I had to go and create a YouTube website because I was told that they were uploading all the all my videos. And, and then somebody reached out, John, it might have been you. Somebody reached out to me and said, you know, they haven't uploaded any of your videos for two years. You keep telling people to go there. So I finally just went ahead and did it myself. Now I get it. They got a lot going on. Um, and there's been staff changes and stuff like that. So I just went ahead and uploaded them. So anyway, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a YouTube website with all the videos on it. That's where I'm going to put all the new, all the uh, podcasts as they come. Like I said, I just did one for the Department of Real Estate, uh, legal documentation necessary. In fact, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but you can get there by going to at Burke Real Estate Consultants, Inc. You can get there by going to the bit.ly link. And DRE has required me to do this because my RPA uh, uh, and BRBC classes have been approved for DRE credit. And so I have to put the general information page up on our website so that you can see it before you sign up for the class. Okay, that's all. Um, uh, case is important. Uh, please remember when you go to the YouTube, we, uh, please like, if you like it, you make me feel good. And, and uh, somewhere it'll tell me who's liking it. Um, but subscribe is more important. So subscribe will tell you every time you log into YouTube that Kevin loaded another video. All right. And so um, and that'll be important to you when as I start doing my podcasts. So, um, again, depending on what SDAR does with me in the future, um, I may end up doing podcasts. So right now, everything's free. Um, at some point, I, I may have to start charging. Uh, you know, I'll probably have an introductory rate like nine ninety five or something a month. Um, but uh, at some point, you know, uh, I can tell you the attorneys call me a lot. So I'm going to start referring them to the web to the uh, YouTube website, to the podcast. But stay tuned for podcasts. 29th of November is when the DRE is going to release the podcast that I just did for them on uh, legal documentation in a real estate transaction. So uh, let me uh, show you what that looks like. Uh, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to type in my uh, favorite website, dre.ca.gov. And then you see this right here where it says consumers. And then you go down here to First Home California. Um, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, and this is something that came up in my conversation with the department the other day, um, they said that the majority of complaints that are filed with the Department of Real Estate are from first time home buyers. And that really makes me sad because that means that we are rushing them through the process. We're not answering their questions. We're not available for them, uh, and they are they are feeling less than represented at the end of the transaction. I think that's a very sad thing to have happen. Uh, and uh, so that that uh, podcast was I thought it was exceptional. Uh, uh, Rick Lope, Lopes, a super super guy, uh, and, uh, and and like everything I come out of, uh, uh, he made a comment. I didn't know that, <laughs> so uh, I I think he was kidding, but uh, yeah, I really like the guy. He's a super guy, uh, and. Uh, and most everybody I've dealt with with the Department of Real Estate have been really, really good to work with. So um, that being said, uh, buyer representation, broker compensation, that's going to be my first series of podcasts. Uh, they will be uh, uh, taped. And then I've got a, a guy in our office who's got, you know, equalizers and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so he's going to be um, putting them together. Um, I, he's thinking one a week. I'm thinking one every three days. Uh, just because I got a lot to tell you uh, and all of it important. So here's the good news. So, you know, all of our forms, like our RPA, it's got 33 paragraphs, right? So, you know, here's my dissertation on paragraph number one. You know, that's the recitals. Here's here's my conversation on two. That's 
agency confirmation. Here's, you know, three, four, and five. And so that's that's the way we'll do it is we'll break it down into paragraphs, much like I used to do for education at SDR. I would break them down. I would do a one hour on each paragraph and sometimes two paragraphs in an hour, depending on the size of the paragraph. And so I'm going to get kind of back to that. So that way you can index them better. You can say, I just want to find out what did Kevin say about 29, right? What do you say about liquidated damages? What do you say about 30, uh, uh, 31 rather, arbitration disputes? Right. And so, again, when I when I do liquidated damages, it's three hours with the attorneys. Right. I've got to explain that to them for three hours. So um, it's not what people think it says. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, watch for that. If you have any subjects that you'd like me to speak about, would you please let SDAR know? Education at SDAR.com. Uh, you can copy me. You can send it to me, copy them. Um, you know, they're working as fast as they can. I know they've, they've bought into a lot of uh, uh, Tom Ferry, and I like Tom, um, but but I serve a purpose for uh, being a practitioner so uh, and uh, supposedly a capable one. So uh, anyway, let them know what you're looking for. I had somebody send in, you know, when's Kevin doing another RPA class, which is the one we just did. And so I'm hoping they're going to give me an opportunity to do a couple of those uh, before we uh, uh, finish out the year. Um, there are not a lot of changes uh, on the on the books for the RPA for December, but uh, you know, stay tuned. That may change. Um, so uh, email updates. Um, uh, again, if you want to know what I'm doing, if you want to know where the podcasts are, if you want to know where the the webinars are, send me an email. Kevin at uh, Burke Real Estate Consultants dot com. Um, I'm I'm proud to say that the name of the company was picked by uh, the guy that owned Remax in San Diego, and he said, "You're not a real estate company; you're a consulting firm." And so, again, half of my work right now is uh, is between uh, litigation; the other half is broker support. Um, anything I can do to help you, I hope you will please let me know. I, I want you to be successful, and as I always say, if you look good, you make me look good. So I really do want you to look good. I sincerely sincerely say that. So uh, if I can help you, please let me know. If you send me a message and I don't respond right away, it could very well be I'm in a in something at the time. Um, certainly, please uh, send it again. I mean, not two minutes later, but send it again so that I know uh, that you're trying to get a hold of me. Um, but uh, that's kind of the general idea. So uh, um, anybody else have any questions? Anybody, uh, anything? Uh, by the way, the podcast, I'm going to be doing some live ones too. Um, I, I kind of just have this in me to have have like the checker speech. Uh, John, do you remember that? That was maybe before your time. But but the um, I always, I said it again this morning. It's not that I know more than anybody else. I've just outlived everybody else. But, uh, you know, I want to do, you know, one of those interactive things where, you know, you can just get on and ask me questions and things like that. And, and that's going to have to be behind a firewall because uh, obviously uh, I don't give legal advice. So uh, anyway, uh, that being said, uh, stay tuned. I'm excited about what we're going to be doing. It's, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities out there. So uh, no other questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, going to let you go a couple minutes early then. I got a, there's, a, there's one in there. Uh, uh, thank you, John. That's very kind of you. That's very nice. And and by the way, everybody, when you type things into the Q&A, nobody else can see it but me. But that's a very kind comment by John Shannon, who is a a, a broker uh, um, and uh, a very capable one. And and uh, actually, I don't know if you're still on education, but you served uh, the association, the membership of the association for many years. Thank you for what you did. And uh um, keep up the good work. And if I can help you in any way, if I can help anybody here in any way, please let me know. Um, uh, and again, thank you for being here today. I appreciate the value of your time. Um, uh, as we say from my uh, hometown of Del Mar, uh, thank you, Yuquan, thank you. Um, uh, from my, and you got my email, right? Because you sent me something for email this morning, and then I'm pretty sure I responded to it. I actually had to look you up because I didn't have an email address. Oh, you subscribed. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and everybody, have a happy Thanksgiving. That's right. You're right. I won't hear from you until the following week. Uh, uh, so remember, put it on your calendar. The 28th of November, I'm doing the buyer representation agreement. And folks, I'm, I'm so excited about that. Two hours is not enough time, but uh, definitely bring a notepad, write things down if that's what we do anymore. Uh, and so uh, as we say from my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you all around the track. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Take care for now. Bye-bye.